We are really honored and, and privileged to have uh, Dr. Jayalath with us here today. He is the Deputy Director General at the Tertiary and Vocational Education Commission uh, here in Sri Lanka. So really, sir, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Um, he will be joined on a panel together with Nelsiwe Dlamini from the Ministry of Education and Training in the, at the, in the Kingdom of Eswatini, as well as Dr. Knut Staring from the University of Oslo. So um, Monica Amua next to me uh, from HISP Uganda will be uh, fielding some questions to the panelists so that we can have a rich discussion. The, the topic today, and please, can, I, can you... Uh, help me in welcoming the panelists up to the stage. <laughs> That's the first, first phase to go. So please, everyone, panelists, welcome. And we give them a big round of applause. Thank you very much. And just to reiterate to our KIX uh, community online, please feel free to take questions. We're trying to... Um, Make sure we collect them and add them. So if you have any questions for the panelists, please feel free to, to add them in and we will, we will support Monica to, to relay those. So thank you very much, everyone. And Monica, please feel free to, to have a seat on the panel. <laughs> so just as a an very short introduction, uh, we feel that one, this panel is really titled um, Expanding the Role of tr a Traditional EMIS. In many, many discussions, we have feel that a very high bar has been placed on a, re a traditional EMIS these days. We have a really growing complexity of our education systems. There's the national, the regional, the international monitoring re requirements that are put onto us. And there has been an increased need for real-time data and for EMIS to support learning. It, we're expected to answer questions about enrollment and, and performance, but now also about well-being, about the teaching and learning processes, about learning outcomes, about pathways, diversity, equity, inclusion, and then as well, the long-term outcomes of all our students. Where do they go next? And an additional layer is the need to, uh, for EMIS to support learning continuity and monitoring. So if we have a crisis on our hands, how do we plan and facilitate uninterrupted access to quality education for those learners? I think COVID, when we think back to, to that time, really it, it added a very new dimension of complexity for us. Education systems across the world try to deploy distance and hybrid learning programs. But in many cases, we were unprepared to reach beyond the, even the school building. And I remember CD telling me this, and I thought I should bring this in. So this is a quote from CD directly. Um, it was, we were unprepared to reach beyond the school building to support teaching, learning, and monitoring during school closures. So we thought it would be important to look at what is this expanding the role of the traditional EMIS, the limited EMIS in a way. So we've posed some questions, and I'm going to now give um, the floor to Monica uh, to help us uh, have a good, uh, rich conversation. Thank you very much, Sophia, and uh, thank you very much, panelists, for accepting our invitation to um, this panel. So just uh, moving on to, to the questions, and uh, I think the first question will be posed to Dr. Jayalat, and uh, Nelsiwa, see what you can both answer. So I think from what Sophia has said, if we took TVET as an example, the TVET sector, um, a 2021 World Bank report um, indicated we are too often not collecting data on the labor market outcomes of these graduates that are coming out of university. So given the partial goal of TVET to create matches between labor and also what um, needs and skills need to be in the, in the market, this component of really understanding the labor market outcomes is really critical to measure the success of the education sector. So really in your own experience, what are some of the biggest stumbling blocks and complexities of linking across ministries and within ministries to really achieve the best uh, outcomes for the labor market? Over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for inviting me to this conference. 
and uh, I am very happy that uh, this kind of data issues are being uh, discussed and trying to uh, find solutions. In the context of uh, technical, vocational education and training in Sri Lanka, uh, if I give some uh, figures, so we have uh, uh, in yearly like uh, 150 to 200,000 student intake and we are running like uh, 6,000 courses per year at uh, 1,000, uh, about 1,700 institutes. So we have like uh, 7,000 teachers in the system. So um, I work for the uh, Tertiary and Vocational Education Commission, which is the, the quality assurance, regulatory and uh, qualification authority for the Tibet sector. So as you uh, mentioned, we are struggling with uh, the data issues. Uh, there are a lot of data issues. The, the, the first issue uh, I would say is uh, the, the interoperability of uh, the systems. So we have uh, traditional systems and we are trying to introduce new systems. Sometimes we cannot uh, migrate or we cannot integrate the systems at real time uh, to talk each other. So that's one of the issues that we are facing. Uh, and another issue is uh, actually uh, uh, data analytics and visualization. So because we have a lot of data, we don't use it effectively. We are not uh, coming up with uh, the, the important information or critical information out of the data. That is one issue that we are facing. There are so many data. Uh, we are not generating uh, enough reports and enough information, useful information. That is one issue that uh, we are facing. And uh, we recently introduced uh, data analytics uh, tool to give these figures because uh, more and more we use the data analytics only we are uh, encouraged to uh, uh, use these reports and uh, get some useful uh, data. Other thing is uh, whether we can uh, use this data on the go, that is the mobile uh, related uh, data applications. Something, uh, for example, uh, now we are working on with uh, mobile TVT guide app because we have uh, 6,000 odd courses that uh, how we are going to give this information to the, the, the students, potential students and parents and other stakeholders. That is one uh, obstacle, or one challenge that we had. Uh, we are trying to solve that issue by introducing a mobile app. And uh, other thing is, uh, the, uh, the monitoring uh, and quality assurance of data. So whether we have uh, clean data, because most of the times we have seen, once we generate the reports, uh, the consistency is less, because of at the original point, we are not entering the quality data. So later stages, it is very difficult to uh, correct it, because the, the original data is already there, so we don't know the real actual, uh, the real situation when it happened at the time. So later it is very difficult to correct unless we have proper validation mechanisms at the, the data entering uh, stages. That is one area. Other, th there are certain emerging trends also. Uh, we, are, we can link this educational data systems with the learning management systems. Now, uh, as an example, uh, the, the, uh, my organization is trying to maintain the database of uh, national competency standards, curriculum outlines, uh, teaching, training, uh, learning resources. So we are trying to, recently we established smart classroom project. We have LMS. We are trying to link up with this LMS into the data system so that students will be able to connect uh, once uh, they come into the portal. There should be one-stop shop. Actually, we cannot uh, attend or we cannot achieve that still. But when, if you have a portal kind of thing for one-stop shop, whether the, once the student comes, they can go to different systems, LMSs, databases, 
uh, uh, quality assurance parts likewise. So that is one area that uh, we need to improve. We are still uh, lacking behind. Uh, I think uh, those are the basic uh, issues that we have in our system. Uh, wow, uh, thank you, thank you very much. And I think that is really enlightening. And to, to see, I think a lot is being done in the TVET sector and um, yeah, as you highlighted, I think it's very important that as we generate this data, we are able to analyze it. And also, you mentioned that you have 6,000 courses that you're currently doing. So uh, I, I would really love to believe that, you know, these courses are also linked to the needs of the, of the labor market. And uh, Knut will, um, I think, share more so on South Sudan. We are currently implementing a TVET, uh, program using DHIS2 in South Sudan. And one of the things that um, the partners from UNESCO mentioned is that, well, I remember his comment is like, I think we are tired of training only hairdressers. You know, we need to train more um, labor workforce that maybe can go into hotel industry that can, you know, do these other um, jobs that maybe are more paying and also that they can be able to support their families. So it's, it's really important. I think I can add one yeah. more point. According yeah. to uh, the labor market information system, we are maintaining a labor market information system and every six months we publish a labor market information bulletin. Actually, we are covering four er five areas. One is the, the demand for uh, jobs and uh, employment information unemployment information, uh, supply from the TVET, uh, which categories they are in, which, in which numbers, and uh, some research, uh, what are the trends, the current trends, and what will happen to the, uh, the labor market in maybe next six months or one year. That is the, some prediction. Uh, we are maintaining that labor market uh, information bulletin. Uh, which is an uh, online document in our website. Wow, this is very fascinating, and it will be good to learn more about uh, your experience in that. So over to you, Nelly. What has really been some of the biggest stumbling blocks and complexities of really linking these ministries together, and how do we ensure that we collect the data that feeds into the labor market? Thank you. Thank you so much, Monica. Uh, thank you, Doctor, for sharing the, your experiences. But um, the issue again, it, it's in, in as much as the labor market and uh, the analysis is there, then for, for me personally, it then comes back to what is happening for basic education. We do have the standards for, from UNESCO to say that, to say Elena has uh, achieved a primary education level. This is the minimum standards that each country should have in place. And it's easier to monitor that. But when it goes, f maybe from, from where I come from, when it goes to the upper levels like the TVET, uh, we find it hard to have like the basic minimum standards of to say that if a hairdresser at this particular level, it, can work in my country, can also go out of the country. This is the minimum requirement for that particular entry in that skill sector. We don't have that. And we, we are not, even the curriculum, it's not, how can I say, standardized across board. So it makes it difficult to monitor that and also to make it speak to say that there are 6,000, how do you find a standard? How do you define the minimum requirements for that particular skill? And how do you then scale it to say, this is the highest level of skill that you can actually accumulate in that? And then how do you monitor that to speak to the labor force or the economic situation for that particular country. I think if we can get that and uh, it can be uh, standardized across board and globally, it would be easier even for the education management information systems to collect that and monitor that and inform everyone in their particular country on the needs 
the, the excess uh, deficit or the projected need of that particular country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nelly. And I think you really raise an important uh, point on the need to have standards, really, and, you know, certification of these courses so that if these, uh, you know, students or youth go into the labor market, at least they have a, a certificate that shows their qualification and ensures that, you know, they get at least the minimum wage or, of, of their skill set. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I'll move over to Dr. Knut, and um, our question today is, uh, in the 2023 KICS coping study, looking at data systems and data use challenges for Europe, Asia, and the Pacific, they identified that uh, more applied research should really be done on horizontal and vertical harmonization and coordination of different data systems that are used for education management. So given your decades of experience from the health sector, working with very big um, health organizations like WHO, do you have any reflections on how management information systems can be simplified to facilitate use of data for policy and planning across sectors and different levels of government? Right. Um, yeah, no, it's... Um, I, I don't know if they actually can be simplified. They, we, we want to, in a way, make things... We want to expand the use of data. That, as uh, was uh, eloquently formulated, we, there is a lot of data, but it's very hard to use. It's very hard to gather it, uh, collate it in in a manner that is easily accessible and, and, and responds to the needs of decision makers as, you know, as, as they need to make the decisions in a timely fashion and in an appropriate sort of format. I think that's a general thing beyond any sector. I mean, health sector, education sector. Um, my, uh, so, so, so it's kind of, I think uh, Einstein once said, you know, make things as simple as possible, but, but not simpler. So, so you, there, is, there is an irreducible complexity, I think, as, as you also highlighted in, in terms of, you know, uh, there's so many trades and skills that, that uh, you want to train on. And if you have 6,000 courses, I'm, I'm sure you cover a whole range. So, so it's, it's, it's not, it's a much easier to standardize, you know, basic numeracy and basic literacy than, 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 than this level where things are really diverging. And the other, the other thing that I observed also from my recent visit to South Sudan is, I mean, you have the, you have the government sector, you also have the private sector. Uh, even the government sector is not one thing. It's the, the Minister of Education, it's the Minister of Labor, they have their own courses. Even Ministry of uh, Agriculture, Ministry of Fisheries, they also do various types of trainings. This, this can, of course, vary from country to country, but it's such a diverse, um, I mean, it's not even one sector, it's really acro almost across society, um, as you said, from hairdressers to, um, to you know, carpenters to plumbers to electricians. So, so it's, it's, it's really complicated. So that's why, in, in the, again, in the case of a very young nation, the youngest nation uh, in the UN, uh, which is South Sudan, it's only gotten independence in 2011. Um, they said, okay, I, even the parliament actually acted, a, a, created what they call the ad hoc committee to support the TVET sector, because they see that even though, of course, university graduates are a big resource for the country, the only way to deal with youth unemployment and, and also actually veterans from various conflicts that they've had um, uh, until recently um, is, is to you know, uh, train people in skills and shorter trainings. It's, it's, uh, uh, you know, even you know, just a few months training or, 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 or like one year training, uh, then you need a simple system. 
So the, the recommendation uh, there has been to try to harmonize. At least we agree on a minimal core set uh, that we we know what uh, what is the what is the name and duration of the training. Uh, a little bit of specifications for for each uh, trade, but but at least you get that overview that will feed into and can be collated with with labor market studies as as, as uh, again Sri Lanka seems to have a very good system for but but matching that sort of the supply and the demand is is always the the, the, the big challenge and I think I think uh, um, in in um, in many places it's it's just even to know what all the institutions that offer various skills training even even just knowing what they what they offer and and and, and approximate numbers uh, for for each um, category um, is is already one step forward but you need to keep it simple and you need to make sure that you get the regular the regular reporting and 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 you and you need to provide some useful data that people actually use and of course that's kind of a vicious cycle or a virtual cycle i mean if people use data then they will demand better quality and then more people will use the data because it's better quality or the opposite if it's if it's bad quality no one will use it then it will stay bad quality right so that is the challenge. Yeah, thank, th you. thank you very much, Dr. Knut. And I, I think you usually tell us to keep it simple. <laughs> yes, he uh, usually tells us to keep it simple, start with the low hanging fruits that maybe can give the greatest impact. And I think that is really important. And your e recent experience in South Sudan, you are in Juba, you know, there's, there were even internet challenges at that point. So as we think of, you know, embracing these systems, how do we, you know, connect with the realities on the ground and what are the trade-offs but also to keep uh, to obtain this important data that we need for decision making I think is key so Sophia the timer is not moving so I don't know how much more time we have but I would really like to open it up to the audience if you have any questions if there are any questions online please feel free to to share thank you Any questions? Nothing from Kix Online, but you're welcome, so feel free. No questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah, uh, Nelly, I think, had some uh, further comments yeah, or questions <laughs> to one no, of the uh, panelists. My question is to Dr. here. Uh, uh, in, in your case, looking at the causes the 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 labor market information systems do you foresee any linkages with the education management information system in sri lanka to say that if a learner is um, exiting the basic education and they are not taking the pathway maybe of um, higher education but they want to take the skills side what are the linkages do you foresee and what are the challenges would you foresee and something to do, do you can you have a basis of integrating those two systems uh, thank you i think uh, there is a very valid question which uh, we are struggling always uh, what is the interconnection or whether there is a smooth transition between the systems is, is an issue. Because uh, we have recently, not recently, maybe three, four years ago, started this uh, 13 years uh, compulsory education uh, uh, mode, which focused some of the students to the, the Tibet sector. So earlier there was no uh, pathway, direct pathway from school to Tibet sector. Now uh, we have this uh, 13 years uh, compulsory education and there's a project in uh, Ministry of Education in Sri Lanka where the, the student uh, wishes wish to have uh, uh, Tibet sector vocational training so they can switch into these uh, classes. Then they can go on with uh, six months in the schools and uh, then uh, they can come to the Tibet sec uh, centers 
so they are given with uh, the opportunity to learn because we have uh, col uh, about 500 quality assured courses we have developed a national competence standard and assessment material and uh, curriculum outlines to those courses so we are giving only that quality assured courses uh, to uh, the students so they are undergoing uh, some training there and after that they are being uh, put to the on the job training in the industry so the industry after the industry there is a uh, evaluation the assessments and after that they are given with the national vocational qualification which is our uh, national qualification system so they are awarded with level uh, 3 or level 4 qualification uh, in different uh, occupational stand occupational areas like plumber masonry carpentry likewise uh, different um, skill based uh, occupation system so we have this uh, uh, also we are now trying to develop a career platform uh, where the students can come and see what are the opportunities uh, they have so what is the career pro uh, progression and what are the career maps what are the other jobs because these students they don't see uh, any jobs other than they are seeing uh, daily daily in their daily routines so we have to give some information to them what are the jobs what are the competencies what you need to do to be a such a person and what is their aspirations and how to match these aspirations with the job requirements in the field what are the emerging and trending jobs likewise we have to give some information to the students only they select some of these jobs so we have to uh, um, uh, give more and more information only their uh, depth and breadth of selection is going to be very wiser so that is one area that we have to look at. Look at. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, Dr. Knut, you have a comment? No, 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 oh, okay. okay, any other comments, questions from, from the audience? Yeah, uh, my name is Sanat Manage. Actually, I'm representing the Save the Children Interest Sri Lanka office. So, I, when the previously also I had a chance to work with the TVX sector because uh, one of the project funded by the World University Service of Canada. So I work as a senior manager for the monitoring evaluation and knowledge management. So in that doc, this question actually for the doctor, I think you already highlighted that there are about more than 6,000 courses in the TVX sector in Sri Lanka. And also I just wonder in that because I know that some of, most of the courses are now outdated, right? And also sometimes some of the, some of the courses is not really match with the current uh, labor demand in the market. So how often in our country system you are modifying or updating or, you know, those, question, those courses and how frequently is this happening? And also is there any gap in this uh, information in the labor market analysis or uh, to get the uh, right decision in this area? I think that is a very critical question because uh, the first I give the answer every three years we are uh, updating these uh, NCSN curriculums that is our uh, standard time so there are some deviations different due to various issues so uh, from these 6,000 courses I must say 3,000 NVQ courses have been run and 3,000 non-NUQ courses. So these non-NUQ courses are also quality assured courses. So there we check uh, their curriculum, what are the learning outcomes, uh, what is the assessment, what is the OJD requirement, whether they are doing continuous assessment, whether they are given proper uh, time duration, the lecturer qualification, all these are checked before approving this course. Once approved, we are publishing it in our website. So anybody who wish to go to a quality assured course, they have to see our website and take uh, a course from there. Otherwise, uh, there are so many other institutions which are not in our quality assurance framework. So these are some low quality. So every day we are, we are seeing some of the advertisements going on in Facebook and social media offering these courses which are not 
registered or quality assured. So we have to refrain from, because every day we are trying to uh, give counter advertisements for these courses, not to uh, go for these courses, because there are so many people are trying to do uh, some businesses out of this environment, because there are so many uh, demand uh, for the Tibet sector because of the economic situation and various other things. So uh, students are trying to uh, get uh, some, take some courses and go abroad and various employment perspectives they are searching for. And uh, we, this, this is uh, actually, we have to get uh, some wiser decision. Once we go into the course, we have to see which, which is this registered program is this accredited program. What we recommend is the accredited program. Accredited program runs in the national vocational qualification and national curriculum. It is very much quality assured than the non-NICU or non-registered course. That is a simple answer. Maybe uh, because we have uh, the we have uh, online dashboard for the development of NCS. There are 200 courses are in the list waiting for development and validation and revision. So if you go to our website, you can see the list. Every course, every, uh, course we mention what is the, the given date, what is the exact finishing date. If this is delayed, what is the remark and what is the reason for delay. So you can see uh, this information in our website. Right, thank you. Thank you very much. And just one last question on that. Uh, like you said, there are so many institutions that are, you know, um, running courses that are not maybe certified. Is there a mechanism uh, in which the TVET uh, department has put in place to ensure that these institutions are licensed to offer these courses, their curriculum is validated? So what processes are being done in that aspect? Yeah. Yes, we have a registration program. That is the basic criteria according to the law. Uh, no uh, institution can run a course without registering our, in our act. That is the law of the country. And we are trying to maintain uh, this. Uh, we are giving online registration application. Whenever they are running a training center, they can uh, apply online. We will visit uh, the institution and we see what are the quality parameters. And if they are fulfilling these quality parameters, we are registering. Otherwise, we ask them to improve their programs. And then later, we register it. That is the mechanism. Uh, so we publish anybody who see these uh, unregistered courses are being run, they can complain uh, to the authorities. So they take the action. That is uh, the mechanism that we put on. Yeah, very, very well. Yes, Sophia? Thank you for that. We, we also have a uh, question online from Petronella. She's asking about, more broadly, does, does the EMIS also cover tracking students who are not able to continue their education, they may be pushed out of education, um, in order to provide them access to skills or training in the TVEC sector? I think that's a very interesting question for really any of the panelists. So how are we looking at those learners who are being pushed out at school level for many different complex reasons and being able to identify them and maybe refer to skills or, or TVET options. Yeah. Um, Dr. O'Nelly, any reflections on that? I think it, it comes back to keeping it simple. <laughs> and, and the good thing um, with the um, innov innovations that have been started with uh, DHIS2 on the semis, I think most of us are just starting out on following and tracking individual learners or, ch or children, because that has the potential of saying, this learner dropped out in this. And that's why I was asking doctor here, how they see themselves linking with basic education. If a learner dro drops out because performance on the core subjects that are supposed to be giving them a white collar job, what can they do in TVET? Maybe that's something that as education and Ministry of Labor and Higher Education, we need to link on to say that if we are on this move to look at individual information, 
we might as well look at the individual in all perspective, like from school, health, and also on trainings, and then on the job market. Uh, it, it's a potential for this system, and we're excited that we're part of the journey, and we're hoping to see that in 10 years' time, not to ask ourselves, what happened to so-and-so in grade three? We should be saying, if you're failing at math, at least you can do carpentry. And TVET should say, we have taken so much from basic education, those who couldn't complete, and they're with us, and they're being trained. And then the labor market is supposed to say, we have employed such and such a number from these programs. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Nelly. I, I, and I think, like you rightly said, this is only the beginning. So with the interconnectedness of the system, we shall be able, for example, using the PIN to follow up a learner who dropped out. And if they are registered into the TVET system using the same PIN, you can easily track, you know, where they are going. So I think it's important, and this is a discussion that we've just started, and having, um, I think, uh, this uh, system being implemented in the various levels or subsectors will really be informative on how can we collaboratively work together to ensure that no learner is really left behind and you know they are of value to their uh, governments yeah yeah so thank you very much uh, thank you the audience thank you the participants online and thank you the panelists for really sharing your insights into this and looking forward to more discussions in future thank you thank you uh, thank you very much everyone and to our panelists we really appreciate you being with us here today